Hello and welcome to another edition of Deathbird Stories. This is part two, where we'll be looking at the next five stories by Harlan Ellison. And what we're going to find out very soon is that the style of the short story, at least Harlan Ellison's style, is very akin to watching the TV show Outer Limits. In fact, Harlan was a writer and sold many of his stories to Outer Limits over the years. And if you don't know, Outer Limits was a show back in the 60s that is black and white, um, very creepy, very odd, very episodic. Every story was different. And that's what we're going to see now. Uh, one of his most famous stories, uh, Demon with a Glass Hand, um, probably his best known, as he would say, his best known television work, how it came about, how he picked the setting. He actually scouted out the hotel it took place in and all that. It's very reminiscent of his original Outer Limit story called Soldier. And if you don't know anything about Soldier, Soldier was sort of the uh, inspiration for the movie Terminator. And he actually won a, a lawsuit against James Cameron for stealing that idea. And the similarities are very similar. So if you're ever curious about uh, Terminator or love the Terminator story, um, look at Harlan Ellison's Black and White, Demon with a Glass Hand, as well as Soldier. You can watch them both somewhere on the wonderful world of the internet, all in like, glorious black and white and fantastic acting and, and casting. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Mostly these next five stories are very reminiscent of that style, not necessarily the setting and the themes, but the, the, the scope, the length, and the, the horror element. So the first story is called Basilisk. Now, believe it or not, this is probably, out of the book, the one I like the least. It's a story of a veteran, a war veteran coming back from home, and the what happens to a relationship when you come back from from a war environment. And of course, there's a lot more going on than just a man and a woman, or a man and a man and a woman, or a love triangle. There's all the events that happen during the war. There's a supernatural event, and it comes in this crazy horror scenario that happens throughout the ending. It's very strange. For me, it's very strange, but it, it feels very much like an Outer Limits episode. So if you like horror, if you like those kinds of ideas, and uh, I guess it's very American in that regard. These are American characters, of course, and you might like that. For me, it didn't really connect. This Again, this is why I'm saying it didn't work for me. It just didn't, I didn't identify it very well. It doesn't mean it's a bad story. It just personally didn't affect me. Now, the next one, this is this is one of his best, in fact, called Pretty Maggie Money Eyes. And again, another very Outer Limits-ish as well. And this is also one of Harlan's personal favorite stories. And if I were to sum up the premise, it would be, what if you have a haunted slot machine that talks to you, and you are a gambling drunk, and you never win, and all of a sudden, every time you play with this one slot machine... You keep winning. What happens? It's it's a simple story. It's easy to pick up. The symbolism with it is very clear and very strong. So if you're not paying attention, maybe short stories aren't for you. But it's such a insightful, scary. Um, it, it's just one of those those stories that you keep you keep remembering. Whenever you go to Las Vegas or you ever go to gambling casinos or what have you. This keeps popping up in my mind. So uh, it's it's a pretty good story. And it works with the theme very well as, as well. So, oh, fantastic stuff. Third one is Corpse. Think of a, okay, a literature professor who hasn't published anything in years. And he goes for a walk and he notices how cars throughout his city are being cannibalized. And there's there's some symbolism behind that. There's some allegory between religion and there's also something like a car hive mind so let's think of the mentality of the car people who love cars and the almost religious like fervor behind that and taken to a religious level not just you know guys like cars but the spirit of of the car and the how it takes the idea of the anthology so clearly and how belief is power is probably this is probably the strongest one I would say, the simplest one out of all the stories that show that belief is power, almost a little too much I think I think it's a bit too tight, it could have been um, less poetic and more 
more direct, more um, more emotional. It's hard to say. You either love it or you're going to go, eh, it's a story. I think this one is is one of those mixed bags of, if it had a bit more clarity, I think it would work well. But it, uh, if it's it's a spin on the on the theme for sure. And Harlan does an excellent job in, in, in capturing the spirit of religion and cars and combining that together. The next one is called Shattered Like a Glass Goblin. Another very Outer Limits-esque episode. And uh, this plays around with the concept of of drugs. So some people might think of this as a very strange, weird, creepy story that you'd be like, oh, this is like a one of those weird Outer Limits episodes that just doesn't connect with you. It's just weird and creepy for the sake of it. You could see it that way, I'm sure. But others might say, wow, this imagery is fantastic because there's all kinds of anthropomorphism in it. And you kind of see how the mentality of the drug addict or drug addicts within a sort of, not a commune, but a shared space, and they sort of degrade into these creatures. So uh, very uh, Kafka's metamorphosis-like, has that vibe. But when you give it to Harlan, it's cranked up as high as you can go. So I think uh, Kafka's metamorphosis story was done in 1910, 1915-ish area. Uh, this was written in 1968, this story. And it's also based around the Vietnam War. So someone coming back, not necessarily from the Vietnam War, like in in uh, Basilisk, but someone who's like a new recruit sort of deal. And the Vietnam War was a big sticking point in the 60s and 70s. I think it went on for 20 years from 1955, 1975. And of course, there's the drug culture of the 70s as well. So this combines both of those ideas and just focuses on what does a relationship and and people and friends surrounding drugs actually do to you. And then it goes even further. And it does it in a physical sense. It's, I think it's quite, I think people can identify it because of that imagery so well. And because of the way he uses these ideas. I'm not going to spoil so much because I don't like, like almost talking about them spoils the story. So I'm only going to say that there is anthropomorphism in it. And it's creepy as hell. And I think it works because of that. And the last one, which is um, hard to describe. This is a fantasy story. Delusion for a Dragon Slayer. Um, we're, we're thrown into Terra Incognita. So you're put into this unknown land. And this was written way back in 1966 before the whole fantasy craze, before... Uh, uh, fantastical romance or swords and sorcery style genre really popped up in the 70s, late or early 80s. So it's very adult version of that because usually those stories are for young adults and they're you know slaying dragons and, and wizards and what have you. So this was, I mean, it's because of the short story format, it's not the same range of, let's say, a Conan epic. So there's not all these books. So you have to be very tight with everything. And it's just, it's it's one of those shocking and strong, fierce message stories that Harlan's known for. And anyone who appreciates fantasy, I think, will pick it up and will learn a little bit about the genre of what it was like before it became popular and what it could have been. Because if, if Harlan uh, inspired anyone, it was to get the raw stories out whether it had sex or violence or drugs or anything. And this is merely the fantastical element. And of course, it deals with the the main theme of gods and belief very strongly. What is the ideal hero? What does the ideal hero win when he vanquishes the, the demon and and he wins the, the maiden? You know, what is that? It, it looks at that to a degree, not directly, but uh, it, it gives you a certain angle of understanding how he writes. And there's a, there's a certain punch to this story. Not as much as I'd like, though, compared to um, Pretty Maggie Money Eyes, for example. There's he, He's sort of subduing, which is, I think, the point of the story, actually. It makes you think about, wait a second, is this really what the hero is supposed to be? 